happy to welcome Joe DeCur today. Joe and I, we've worked together for a number of years uh, in the Consumer Technology Board of Governors. Um, so uh, I was really happy when Joe accepted the invitation to give a talk. I would like to hand over to uh, Dr. Uh, Joel Fai to introduce Joe. Thank you all for coming and uh, please stay tuned to further events. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, Estefan. And thank you, Joe, for um, being with us here today. We are very keen on listening to your interesting talk. So um, here is a short biography of um, Professor Joe DeCoeur, who is a veteran of computer industry <clears throat> and a contributor to several of the earliest computing um, games. Um, Joe worked in two of the companies that originated today's multi-million dollar com computer gaming industry, uh, Atari and Amiga. And he led the design of several of the most successful gaming computers of that era. He was involved professionally with many of the people who built and established this industry sector, such as Ralph Baer, Jay Miner, Nolan Bushnell, and the founders of um, Activision to the name, but a few. DeCoeur was one of the original engineers on the consumer side at Atari, who helped the design, build, and produce of the Atari VCS, also known as Atari 2600. At the same time, he also wrote the video game Olympics, a point collection of games that launched with the system. He later went on to help architect and develop the Amiga graphics originated computer and made significant contributions to the USB architecture at Microsoft Corporations and at MCCI. Today, the query is still developing public engineering standards, particularly Bluetooth technologies and the Internet of Things and he writes regular articles for IEEE Consumer Electronics Magazine on these themes. He was elevated to the IEEE Fellow in 2014 in recognition of these contributions. He is currently a professor at the University of Washington, Seattle. Thank you very much, Joe, for being with us here today, and we are all keen on listening to your interesting talk. Thank you, Joe. You're welcome. I'd like to make a small correction. I was a leader or a contributor on many things, but I like the way that the IEEE elevates people to fellow for contributions to things. We all stand on the shoulders of the people who did the works before us, and they turn around and stand on our shoulders. Um, so we do what we learn, what there is, we contribute what we can, and we get out of the way for the next generation. And the thing that gets me out of bed in the morning right now is training the next generation of engineers uh, so that they can grow up and make, oh, I see, I have to change the logo on this slide deck. It should say consumer technology. That's right. This is obsolete. Okay. so. Here we are. This is three generations of animation machines at Atari and Amiga. And you've heard my introduction, so we're going to continue. How I got here working on three what are now called retro machines. This first machine here first shipped commercially in 1977. So that's 44 years ago. This machine first shipped commercially in 1979, that's 42 years ago. This machine first shipped successfully in 1985. So that's what, uh, 36 years ago? Yeah. <laughs> okay, so that's how I wound up here. Um, let's talk about early video games first. So my work, there was a museum here in the Seattle area called the Living Computer Museum and Labs. And these three machines were actually on display there. Because of COVID, it is now closed. But this is examples of what they all looked like. 
And the, the nice thing about the Living Computer Museum is they're all set up to actually play. First video games. Um, I wasn't aware of them, but Ralph Baer was a pioneer. Um, a, uh, Bob Frankston and I, whom Stefan also knows from the Consumer Technology Board of Governors, made a pilgrimage to visit him in his basement in 2014, the same year that he finally died. He, his basement is so famous that the Smithsonian Institution, History and, uh, and Industry Museum, took it apart, moved it and set up that museum in a specially built room as a shrine to Ralph Baer in Washington, DC. Now he imagined that it would be possible to use a television <clears throat> for interactive entertainment rather than simply watching whatever the networks put out to us. So he imagined this little box that was all passive. There were no microprocessors in it that animated a pair of moving objects that were basically paddles and a third moving object, which is basically a ball. And he worked for a defense contractor, not in the consumer electronics industry. So his, in, his employers didn't know what to do with it. So finally, they made a contract with a company called Magnavox. They were a big makers of TV sets at the time. And they put together this version of it called the, the Magnavox Odyssey, and they shipped it in 1972. Okay, so that's there. And Nolan Bushnell, founder of Atari, still alive, saw a demonstration of it. And he said, this is a good idea, but a terrible implementation. So he came home and he told his chief engineer, Al Alcorn, to go build a good version of that. They made an arcade game, they called it Pong. It was a wild success. They installed one of them in a bar in Sunnyvale, California. And they got a tech support call in a week saying, it stopped working, come fix it. He came to fix it. He discovered that it was broken because the coin box was completely full of quarters. You couldn't push another quarter into the coin box. So he emptied the coin box and he said, call him again when he has this problem again. And so they had this big hit. So they, Atari went off and was pioneering arcade games. So they pioneered a game called Tank, where you drove some tanks around and they shot at each other. They pioneered a, a one player version of um, what amounts to Pong, but it's turned the other directions here, knocking bricks out of a wall. It, that was called Breakout, et cetera, et cetera. They built a new system. They decided to make an integrated circuit and they brought it home to compete with the Magnavox Odyssey. That was a big hit. And they said to themselves, what are we gonna do next? And they were thinking, well, let's see. Um, Pong was random logic, no microprocessors. They were also thinking about building a microprocessor based system with enough general IO capability so that different programs could make different games a lot faster. And they were working on both versions, but I was really lucky. I had studied in college computer architecture. I understood programming. I had been working in medical electronics, so I understood data acquisition and stuff like that. So, I, and I studied the microprocessor that it turns out they were interested in and uh, I went to Westcon in September of 1975 and bought a 6502 and I was educating myself on this microprocessor. So I went to interview for a job at Atari and I didn't know that they had chosen that microprocessor to work on. So I aced the technical interview and then they're walking out through the lobby at the Atari headquarters in Los Gatos, California. And here's a bunch of arcade games and they bypass the coin slot. So you just push a button and you can play the game. And I thought, oh, they're going to interview to see how I fit into the culture. I realized 
that that was what was going to happen. And luckily, that summer, I had played an Atari tank game. So I had a clue. <laughs> so they said, you want to play a game? And I said, uh, I looked around the room and I saw a tank game. And I walked up to the tank game. And I looked at the tank game. They said, you want to play some tank? I said, yeah. And I played three games with the interviewer. And I won one of the three games. I was hired on the spot. One of the luckiest days in my life that didn't involve the births of my children. So that's how I got into it. So this is what Pong looked like, right? So Pong had a score. The brown box did not. So here is a rectangular thing, a paddle, and it's hitting this ball, or in this case, this guy probably hit it, and he's going to get up and make sure it doesn't cross the back here, right? It, the instructions basically said, keep the ball in play for a high score, right? This is what the artwork on the tank game looked like. So you drove around these little tank shaped objects and they shot little missiles at each other. Okay, I played a passable game. So let's talk about this machine. This interview took place at Thanksgiving 1975. So we're talking a long time ago. I got lucky, like I say, I got hired to do this I made several contributions. I did not invent the idea. The people at Atari's think tank, Cyan Engineering, had the general set of concepts. And so they designed a piece of hardware and software, but they hadn't got it to work yet. So my first job after being hired was to move up to Nevada City, California, get an apartment, and get the thing to work. I had to learn how, I knew how oscilloscopes work. I'd never used a logic analyzer before, but I learned how to use a logic analyzer. So this is what one of the original prototypes looked like. And this photograph is, this machine is on display at the Computer History Museum in Mountain View, California, right? So this is what I got to debug. And this is a picture of me taken many years later when the machine was finally shipped, it was in a box shaped like this. Um, I, my hair had gotten a little bit grayer since I did the work. It's gotten a lot grayer since then. It was fun. We would go to work and we would joke about paying to work there. Nolan Bushnell thought this was quite funny. Of course, he wanted the quarters. Um, let me talk a little bit about how it worked. So this was at a time when semiconductors were orders of magnitude more expensive than they are now. And so for example, enough display for a four color display with this resolution, if it was square, might've cost tens of, you know, might've cost us 20, $30. If it was a square bitmap with this resolution. So we made several innovative moves to do this. The first of all, let's see, like the, we look first of all at the design of the system. We had a microprocessor. We had a general purpose chip. It had 128 bytes, not 128 kilobytes or gigabytes or megabytes. It had, had 1000 bits of RAM. It had a 16-bit timer and it had 16 bits of general purpose I.O. Some was connected to the console switches, some was connected to the game controllers. Jay and I, and I'm still alive and Jay died in 94, we designed this special purpose chip which was horizontal line oriented, not frame oriented. So the microprocessor executing a program in read-only memory, and these are 2K bytes or 4K bytes. It executed code that would compute what to write to the line buffers and write the line buffers. It would write to a location that said, wait for horizontal sync. So it would freeze this activity till the right time just before horizontal 
blank started, and then it would shove a bunch of bits into this chip here, and then spend the rest of its time figuring out what to display next while this thing is busy actually generating video output. This also had some logic that generated some sounds. And that was FM modulated onto the video signal and driven through an RF oscillator to the TV set. So this is what the system looked like. So what it did in time, the microprocessor owns the vertical, the hardware owns the horizontal. So imagine in American TVs, there's 228 color clocks per horizontal line. And there are about 100, 262 horizontal lines in a non-interlaced frame. And so the, the summation of those two works out to approximately 60 Hertz. That's because American power is 60 Hertz. I don't know if Australia uses PAL or some other TV standards, but this is what we had in the US. Yeah, it's PAL. Right, and so your power is probably 50 Hertz. So the horizontal lines are a little bit different and the number of vertical lines is much larger. But the general ideas apply. The microprocessor itself says, oh, it's time for, for to turn on vertical blank. And then it waits a while and then it turns on vertical sync. And so in the old CRT style TVs, those magnets behind the TV screen start ramping back up to the top again. And then it stabilizes, it finishes the vertical blank time and it turns on display time. And during display time on each horizontal line, part of the time is flyback, basically horizontal blank. And there's a little window of horizontal sync as well. The hardware controls horizontal sync and horizontal blank. And so during this time here, during the blank time, the microprocessor is busy um, computing graphics pointers, loading up the television interface adapter, shoving things into the hardware, which then displays things on the lines. And because the microprocessor controls the vertical, the microprocessor can change modes from line to line. And in this particular case, it's decided, oh, I'm going to use Playfield to generate scores. And here it's using um, moving objects to generate two 8-bit objects and one of several 1-bit objects to make this little bullet or missile flying out of this imaginary tank. So it would draw this background in A color draw this in a different color, draw this in a third color. If there was a fourth, another moving object, it would be the same color as the play field. That's all this system could do. And what it did is it spent most of its time computing and displaying stuff. So this is giant device driver here. And up here, when it falls out the bottom, it sets that timer and it goes off to do things that it knows how much time they're gonna to take to uh, listen to the user controls, detect and process collisions, decide what the new game state is. Maybe this tank is gonna move somewhere. Maybe this tank is gonna change direction. Maybe this is gonna move in some direction. Maybe he's gonna fire something, whatever. And compute what the score, like if this thing hits this thing, the collisions will be detected and the logic might say, oh, he just scored a point and this number would change, right? So this is game flow, program flow for this game using this design. So this was crude, but this was designed in 1976 when we're, we have to go way back in terms of Moore's law. The custom chip here, this had 
how many of you know how large the features are in modern CMOS today? We're usually talking nanometers, right? Anyone? So here, instead of um, instead of nanometer scale, we're at micrometer scale. The features in this chip were 10 microns. So they're more than a thousand times larger in each direction as modern chips. Does that make any sense? Hello? I need some feedback. Yeah, I need that makes sense. I've got yeah. somebody in the audience. Good. Okay. So this is, <laughs> like I say, 40 some years ago. And so this is what the original version of the product looked like. You'd put a cartridge into this slot here. Here's the console switches. The controllers would plug in the back. I worked on combat, which is jet fighters and tanks and biplanes. I worked on video Olympics, which is 50 variations on Pong. And so this is the stuff that we were shipping in 1977. So um, what did we learn? And I, we had put the definition of the display in the hands of the game designers who were a lot smarter than we, the hardware designers imagined or expected. You should always be designing things that give your customers license to create new and wonderful things that you haven't imagined. This is one of the, you know, if I were to write my epitaph, it was like, I'm glad I was able to create, you know, new artist mediums. <laughs> to make up new stuff. Our conclusion was that our second system couldn't simply be a bitmap, which we could finally afford, and a processor. It had to allow the, we had to imagine ways that the game designers could do things that we couldn't expect and surprise us some more. So we had created a platform for the art of others and we planned to build on that for the next system. And we knew that we had to move fast. We expected lots of competition. When we brought out Pong, we got lots of competition immediately. When we started building more complicated systems, we got competition immediately. The whole history of consumer electronics is competition. So we knew that if we didn't eat our own lunch, someone else would come along to do it for us. So our next system came out only two years later. The first machine came out in 1977. It shipped for 10 years. It sold 30 million units. The next machine came out two years later. Any questions about these before I proceed? Yep, all good. Good, thank you for that. All right, so the next system. The first machines were called the Atari 400 and the Atari 800. We'll get to that in a minute. Um, so this is the second system. So we got lucky. How many of you ever heard of a book called Soul of a New Machine? I recommend it. It's old. It's by a guy named Tracy Kidder. It was about the development of Data General's answer to the deck vax. So the book was published in 1982 about work that was that was shipped in 1981, 82, 32-bit mini computer. And it was about watching the development of a system. And a lot of the people who worked on that Eagle system had worked on the Jada General Nova, which was their first system. The idea being you do a good job at some piece of design work and it's successful, you might get to do it again. They call that pinball. So we got to continue advancing technology. So I said I was lucky to get the first job. I was lucky to stay employed. But we had a hard decision to make. Is the next machine a better game console or a personal computer or both? Now, coincidentally, but not in the slides, I knew the founders of Apple. 
They were our contemporaries. Steve Jobs used to work at Apple. Uh, through Steve Jobs and the Homebrew Computer Club, I met Steve Wozniak. In fact, a year and a half ago, I successfully nominated Steve Wozniak to be an IEEE fellow. I understand how they worked. And the upside of how they worked was that Steve Jobs had a very strong set of useful ideas about what the end users wanted to see in a product. So there were a lot of people experimenting with home computers in the late 70s, but Steve Jobs came up with the first, in my opinion, wildly successful appliance computer. Everything else, you needed to be a, a hobbyist. You needed to understand electronics to get the first microcomputers to be assembled and work. You didn't have to do that with an Apple II. And that came out in 1977, the same time that the Atari game console came out. So we're sitting there, we know these people. In fact, in June of 1977, I turned down Steve, Wozni Steve Jobs to come work at Apple a second time. He asked me once again in 79, <laughs> I said, no. Um, so are we trying to build a game console or are we trying to build a personal computer or both? We've got a choice to make. Now, for a better game player, because I'm focusing on animation here more than personal computers, we wanted to support memory mapped video display because it's just too much to expect the microprocessor to keep up with everything that it, it had to do in the time allocated. And we thought we could afford at least four or eight K bytes of DRAM. What we had discovered is that the company's trying to make 16 K bytes, 16 K bit DRAMs. Those devices frequently had defects. And we found some vendors who were willing to sort them into, uh, here's one with a defect in this half of memory or a defect in this half of memory. So they would sell us their leftovers cheap. So our first machines didn't actually come with 4K of DRAM, they came with 8K bytes of DRAM because we would buy them in lots where we knew where the defects were. All right, so we thought we can afford a, a bitmap finally. We wanted to use that map, bitmap in various ways. If you wanted to have a four color bitmap, that means you need two bits per pixel to do 160 by 192 pixels. We thought that's good. Now, if you go back for a moment, that's basically this resolution right here. If I'm gonna do a bitmap that's shaped like that in four color, that's kind of what I need. Now, if you were a bunch of my students, I'd say, so how many bytes is this? <laughs> I'll get blank stares from you. But the answer is several K, so tens of K actually. We wanted to be able to do monochrome to 320 pixels across by 192 non-interlaced vertical. And we had the inspiration that if we were gonna support computer applications, we wanted to put character generation in hardware. And if we did, not only could we support eight by eight characters, but we could double up pairs of bits and make uh, four color characters as well. I'll illustrate that in a later slide. Now we had five sprite engines in the first machine. Two of them were eight bit and three of them were one bit. And they were reusable vertically, which are prog clever programmers illustrated a lot. So this new machine had eight sprite engines. Four of them were four bit wide and four of them were two bit wide. And they were all reusable vertically. We wanted to have provisions for vertical and horizontal scrolling. What does this mean? Imagine I've got a display and here's the edges of the screen. And I wanna be able to slide it smoothly, left to right or up and down. 
we decided to get it all to work to add a simple video coprocessor, which we called a displayless processor, so it can change modes on the fly. Notice that in this display, in the top screen, we've got it in a character mode, large characters, easy to see. And here we're changed to a different kind of mode. And we wanted the, that kind of flexibility to change modes on the, at least vertically on the fly. And so as a matter of fact, the fellow who designed this chip here, we had several chip designers because we could afford it. And Doug Neubauer designed this potentiometer and keyboard can scanning chip. It did non-video IO. So he got his stuff to work early. So he got bored. So Doug Neubauer went and developed the killer. This game was so good that our arcade people wanted to build an arcade version of this game. And this thing changes modes. It's got a bitmap and some overlaid character arrays. And it's generating lots of basically moving stars where he calculated how to make the motion work so that you look like you were flying through space. And he would put these other, you know, alien things that you're flying through space shooting at, right? And then it comes down the screen and it changes mode. And now it's basically control information. It's giving you the coordinates and how far away different targets are. And it's got um, some indications of how many lives or how many, how much fuel you've got, blah, 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 right? So imagine this is a first, first, person, per, first person shooter game. And to control this game, you needed a keyboard. Now we were originally thinking we were gonna build a game player and a computer, but we had this meeting in the fall of 1978 and marketing came back and said, oh, we have to have a, some kind of keyboard so that you can play that game <laughs> because it was such a killer game, right? So we wound up spending a little bit extra money and putting in a basically a membrane keyboard into this. I have friends of mine who are now in their 50s that I've worked with on Bluetooth standards for 10 years. And they were young enough that this was their first computer because the retail price was about 500 bucks. Hey, Joe, um, I just want to butt in, but um, I've still got this machine. And you're right, Star Raiders was such an awesome game. I actually went and bought the machine that played the game. <laughs> <laughs> and uh and then, and then i ended up you know being a, a game programmer yeah. okay well cheers um you you and i have both been uh, convictable for turning people's children into couch potatoes <laughs> for different reasons um, so but here so he came up with this killer game so they decided to put a keyboard on it but we also designed it explicitly so that this machine was capable of doing common arcade games and to illustrate that well i'll get here's the games i'm i'm getting ahead of myself so let's suppose we've got a a character map and or a bit map now so we designed this flexible system that can change modes on the fly and so that display list processor on sets of line basis can say okay I'm in low resolution character mode. I'm in very, oh, this is low. The, oh yeah, here we go. Here I am 40, character, 40 bits across by 24 lines vertical. So that resolution here is like this, 40 characters across 24 vertical, right? That's low resolution, but you know, for some things that's more than adequate. And at the top end of its range, it can do 320 pi pixels across and 192 vertical in two color. 
And this is the number of bytes per screen, right? So these are whole, you know, eight different bitmaps. It has 12 different character maps. In this mode, 20 characters across, they're 12 lines tall or 24 lines tall. And this is the number of colors. So each character has two bits that say, specify what color it is. Here is uh, their, their monochrome and color characters here. These are monochrome and these are colored characters. And on the next screen, here's some examples of what they might look like. In the largest characters, they're this tall or this or double that size. If you have the same, these are sets of bits, the A character, the Chevron character and the duck character. So if you display this pattern this way, this is what it looks like. If you display it as a multicolor character, pairs of bits are used to choose the color. So this pattern here looks nonsensical, but this pattern here looks like colored chevrons. So this gives you an idea of the kinds of resolution and colors and maps that you can build with this kind of character. This here, this big bit pattern, displayed this way looks kind of like a duck. And here it looks kind of like a duck, except here it's monochrome and here it's um, colored. And it looks nonsensical here, but it makes sense here and it makes sense here. What we had is a very flexible system that allows us to build things that looked alphanumeric or things that were colored and mix them together on a line by line basis. By the way, those of you who are familiar with the NES, the NES used exactly this color method here extensively. That's mostly what it does. But we shipped this in 1979 and they shipped their machine six years later. So this is about how to build a flexible system in general. And notice, by the way, that if we had the ability to grab eight bytes at a time, our hardware is an easy modification to say, use pairs of bits to choose a color or use pairs of bits to do the first bit and the second bit. Same set of bits changing the color mode. So once we had discovered how to do monochrome characters, color characters was an easy modification. If we want a personal computer, remember the struggle we have is game machine or personal computer. They have different needs. So we wanna have characters, but the bandwidth limits of American TVs, and they're not much different from the bandwidth limits of PAL TVs, we could basically get maybe 40 characters per line. But if you're gonna do productivity, you need a keyboard. We needed to provide for peripheral expansion like for printers and communications. We wanted slots like the Apple II and the S100 machines, but FCC American RF rules prevented that. Remember our first machine and our second machine were connected to the back of a TV set to a switch box. And so if they weren't very well designed, we're putting all that RF, modulated RF, straight back up the antenna, which means our neighbors are gonna see it too. And they're not gonna be happy about that. We wanted slots, we couldn't have slots. So we wanted to design a serial bus, which is a direct ancestor of USB. Small aside, so we didn't patent the SIO. And if we had patented, it, it might have still applied. Many years later, when I was at Microsoft working on the original USB, which was a serial bus. Now, some patent trolls came out of the woodwork and sued the USB implementers forum 
on serial buses, they said, oh, you're infringing our patents. But their patents were older than the Atari machines. So the USBIF at my prompting went back to them and said, oh, uh, look at this old Atari SIO machine. And it was shipped in 1979 with all the technical documentation about how it worked. It wasn't a trade secret. So those patents were older than the patent trolls patents. So they lost their patent rights because of the Atari machine. <laughs> nice problem to have. So if you were to put together a 1979 machine, you could have a printer, drive, you have, drive a TV, you have a floppy disk drive, maybe you could have a cassette machine also. The upside of this was flexibility that, and customers could put them together easily. The downside is this machine had a big Faraday cage inside to keep all that radiation inside. That means this serial bus ran at 19.2 kilobits per second. So we had to put another microprocessor inside the disk drive and another microprocessor inside <laughs> the printer, which means the aggregate cost of the whole system was larger. Does that make sense? Anyone? Just making sure you're still there. Yeah, you're still there. Yeah, I don't want to lose my audience. Okay, so this system here might look like this. You know, we got audio coming out and video coming out to the TV or the monitor. Here's the main system with the keyboard built into it. So serial IO comes out, it might go into the floppy drive controller. It might daisy chain to the, let's say an 850 device, which had uh, an old Centronics compatible printer port so we could drive a classic 80 column printer. It has serial ports on it for uh, V24 ports so we could drive, you know, legacy data modems talking to the public switch telephone network. When I left Atari, I designed a lot of these. So that's how it would fit together. This is what the inside of the CPU looked like. We reused the same microprocessor, but running a little faster. We designed this chip, this chip, and this chip. It had slots in it for the built-in operating system slots in it for the built-in random access memory. The 800 version had two cartridge slots. The, the game machine had only one cartridge slot. The, um, right. And we, this device would go to memory and pull stuff out of memory and throw it at the video which then drove the picture and drove the sound and drove the sound coming out of here and here. And we had an off the shelf part to expand to talk to more game controller ports. Off of this thing here, the serial bus could talk to disk drives and other peripherals. So this is how the system fit together. Now, I told you we designed it so that it could do common commercial popular arcade games. And this thing did a really nice job of it. Obviously it could do Pac-Man, it could do Donkey Kong, it could do Space Invaders, it could do Galaxian. This is a whole lot of moving objects and we could build it so that these moving objects here were built with characters, multicolored characters. And then if we decided to have something break off and fly at you, we would turn off the character and install a moving object in its place and then make it fly off and then come attack you. So <clears throat> we had a lot of fun getting all these things to work. So what did we learn from this? Well, let's see, as a game console, we had good self-development tools. This machine was powerful enough that you could write games for it on it. So it was a platform for artists. The guys who founded Activision hadn't left Atari yet, so we weren't afraid of them yet. <laughs> that came later. As a computer, 
we weren't as aggressive. The FCC changed the radiation rules shortly after we shipped it. And so we didn't do the cost reductions before Commodore did. So Commodore, we sold about 6 million units total and they sold 17 million units total. So it'd be nice if we had built a unit with a built-in floppy disk drive, we never did. We built some and didn't ship them. It'd be nice if we built something with an expansion unit with hardware slots, we never did that. This is what a cost reduction would have done, but it came out as Atari was collapsing in 1984. So on my last day at Atari in June of 1979, I had some conversations with some buddies and I said, imagine we did a stops out as best as I could imagine, high powered entertainment computer. This is a scan in my engineering notebook from the time. I said, suppose we use a 68,000 or a Z8000, you know, a 16-bit microcontroller, microprocessor, some dual ported memory or DMA, so we could have uh, a serial communications DMA channel. Ethernet wasn't invented yet. We could have a, a bi-directional disk channel, bi-directional audio channel, bi-directional video channels to write out much better animation. We had this concept. Um, I went off to work on other things for a while. So let's go to the third generation. I got even luckier. I reunited with J Miner and some other good engineers to build our third system. It was a ground making animation machine. It could do things like this. It could do things like this. This is a screenshot from a live machine. So as a game console, which is what we were focused on first, we wanted cartoon level animation. The president of the company wanted to be able to render cartoons in real time, which means we need to accelerate bitmap manipulation in hardware. And we wanted also to be able to synchronize with external video. Between Atari and Amiga, a company had come out with an arcade machine called Dragon Slayer. And what had happened is they had built basically a video disc machine into this coin-op machine. And it had a big tree of possible animation outcomes. So all of it was hand-drawn, really good animation. But because it was a fixed video system, it wasn't actually interactive if a person watched somebody successfully play the game and remembered all the moves that they made to successfully play the game, they could walk up, drop their first quarter in, do all the right moves and win, and then there's nothing else to learn. But we could see that we wanted to be able to like synch synchronize with external video. So that's where we were coming from. And we thought our first machine was going to be a game console expandable to a computer. That was our concept. But we wanted to build a computer with 80 column character displays. And at that time in history, the IBM PC had come out and there had become a market for monitors that didn't talk over the air TV at all. So they could have higher resolutions. We wanted to have enough bitmap memory for a Xerox Alto like Windows OS. This is before Microsoft Windows. This is before Mac OS. We were doing this design work in 1982. We wanted larger memory. We thought we could afford a 16 bit wide memory. So we thought at least 64 K bytes of memory would be the minimum system in a machine. If we were building a pure game machine, we might have had uh, 16, 16 K memories for a 32 K bit machine. And we designed this so it could make really heavy use of a very small memory. Note in passing the NES, which was a wild success, had two K bytes of RAM. We were looking at a machine that had 32 K bytes of RAM. 
we decided we wanted to have a 3.5 inch floppy disk drive from scratch. So we would distribute software on floppy drives, not on ROM, ROMs. The inside of the system, this is a simplification of it, 68,000, which had a 24-bit address, 16-bit data bus. We had a chip that did DMA and had 29 different, 28 DMA channels. It was this generated addresses and it was paired up with the device that captured the data and put out video, RGB video and whatnot. So this was a pair and we also had a chip that did non-video IO that did audio, four channel sampling, um, serial DMA uh, for communications, disk IO and ports. And this is a, an example of a system, you know, 256K byte DRAMs times 16. That's an example. We, the simplest system would be smaller. We'd externally have a MUX so that we ran this memory at color clock rate and this machine at half color clock rate. So at minimum, the hardware got every other memory cycle out of here. And it only needed to slow the processor down if it was doing really intense stuff. Now, what this system could do in memory, it had the first Jeep um, graphics processing unit. I've been called into court twice to testify on these patents. Mercifully, they've all expired. You could, under software control, draw a pair of points somewhere in memory. You could tell the hardware line draw and it would read the memory, find it and extend the line until it found another one and stopped. So you could spot two points. You could tell the thing line draw and it would go through and line draw. You could, maybe you'll add a second line. So in an operation, you'll spot two ends of this line. You'll call the hardware and it'll draw the line. Then you can take this piece of memory and you can say to the bit blitter, I want you to um, extend, make solids. So the hardware will walk through this here. It'll see this one and it'll propagate the one until it sees this one again. And it does all these operations in basically the time it takes to read and write the memory locations. So this thing can draw polygons under hardware control in 1985. Now to illustrate the most common thing it would do, if I had, let's say, I had um, drawn a two color or four color image in memory and it's shaped like this, suppose it's a tank sprite. Right, I'm just simplifying it as an eight by eight thing. But suppose this is the first blitter input and I've got an outline of what the tank looks like. So this is a cookie cutter for this thing. And suppose I have a random multicolored background that I'm gonna splice this into. So if you could put the first input and the second input and the third input into the blitter engine and you program it correctly, the blitter engine says, okay, if this is a one, I'll take this pixel. And if it's a zero, I'll take this pixel. So in the time it takes the blitter to read this and read this and read this, it produces this. So I can take this and splice it on top of this using this as the cookie cutter. Which means that if I'm trying to do animation, I can draw any kind of random background I want. And I don't need moving objects, separate moving objects to generate lots of other background and just you know draw big polygons and then splice them all together. And it'll do this, it'll touch um, 60,000 pixels per second. What did we learn? I'm 
pretty much out of time, so I'm going to try to close up here. The lessons we learned. The collapse of the video game market in 1984 caused a pivot to only build a computer first rather than building a game player first. So it came out in 1985. It could do better animation than anything else on the market until the Super NES came out seven years later. But it came out in 1985 instead of 1992, so it costs a lot more money to make because of Moore's Law. Now, meantime, we didn't originally plan to build a personal computer, but we slipped a year. And because we slipped a year, we hired some talented programmers who wrote Amiga OS, which is a windowed operating system. It was the first multimedia, multitasking OS. It was 10 years before Windows 95 or Mac OS caught up. So we were way ahead of our time. But Commodore, the company which bought Amiga, was not able to exploit this market niche. It was too small versus the, the IBM and the Mac markets for application software. They actually foolishly tried to sell the Amiga 1000 through Toys R Us, which was insane. So <laughs> they didn't do very well. The Amiga is still a cult machine. I think two or three million got sold over a long time. It still has fans all over the world. Um, plays great games, but um, in terms of market presence, it's uh, also ran. Now, where to learn some more? Um, there is a great book, MIT Press published, called Racing the Beam, about how this thing works. There's a great big book that somebody else named Jamie Lindino wrote about the Atari 8-bit computers called Breakout. There's a great book that MIT Press wrote about the Amiga computer called The Future Was Here. I'm working on a sequel of, you know, basically complete this series. I've only written 11,000 words so far and I don't have time to finish it, but I should finish that book. These two guys wrote a book called Atari, Business is Fun. This is, I consider the definitive social history of Atari. Warren Robinette, who wrote Adventure, has written a book called Annotated Adventure. Um, I hope it's published by now. Steve Hug written a great book and a website called Making Games for Atari. There is a website where you can go online and um, construct games that are emulated. So it's a web service. Chris Crawford wrote a terrific book called De Re Atari about how to write games on the Atari 8-bit machines. I wrote a series of articles for the IEEE Consumer Electronics Society magazine. It's been renamed Consumer Technology Society, but it was called CES at the time. So these three here are articles published in IEEE Spectrum way back in March of 83, um, a pair of people wrote a terrific book explaining the Atari video computer system design haste history. And Paul Wallach wrote a book on the Amiga in March, 2001, because it still had a cult following all the way then. These two guys here, Goldberg and Vendel, have assembled this online Atari museum. So, Here's how to find me. I live in Issaquah, Washington. I'm an IEEE fellow for working on those machines. Um, here's how to find me an email. And some people who have time to burn made up a little card of me <laughs> holding one of these machines. So who's got a question that I can answer? Yeah, Joe, um, how did Atari name all their chips? You know, that interesting name, Sally, Daphne, Agnes, all these sorts of things. How, how did that come about? Well, the first thing to point out was the name of this system here. The code name for this machine is Stella. And you're thinking, why Stella? Well, the answer was I owned in fact, I still own a working bicycle made by a defunct French company called Stella. 
And I used to write it to work every day. And I'm sitting there in my office in March of 1976, and Jay wants me to come up with a password for the time sharing service where we assemble the 6502 machine code to load into our hardware. Because that little machine that you see here was not capable of running a self-assembly, right? So I had this TI Silent 700 terminal and I needed a password and Jay says, don't use your mother's maiden name, someone will guess it. So I look at my bicycle and I say, Stella. So my password is Stella. And Jay thinks, that's a good name. He says, let's name the chip that. So he decides that he wants to name the chip Stella. And his boss likes the name and decides that he wants to call the whole system Stella. And Jay says, nuts, I just lost a good name. So he came up with another woman's name, Television Interface Adapter or Tia. I actually know, knew two different women named Tia. So this was renamed Tia. And so they started naming everything after a woman. So this machine example has, well, these aren't named after women anymore, but the machine itself, the computer version was called Colleen. We had a redheaded uh, administrative assistant named Colleen that it was named after. And there was a woman who worked in production, I believe, named Candy, and they named the game machine after her. Now, the Apple people picked up this habit not knowing where it came from. And so the Apple people started nicknaming all of their machines after women as well. And it turns out their first workstation, which was codenamed Lisa, which happened to be Steve Jobs' daughter's name, that wound up being the shipping name for their first workstation. That was unusual. But that's where a lot of those names came from. Now, this one here, potentiometers and keyboards. This was the Colleen television interface adapter or George's television interface adapter. Antic meant alphanumeric TV interface chip. Does that answer that question? Yeah, that's that's fantastic. Um, and is that why the 2600 emulator is called Stellar as well? Exactly. All right. Oh, well, that's, I've been programming these machines for a long time and I never knew how they were named. So that, that's fantastic. Well, that's true. You know where to find me now. So any other questions that I can answer? Um, yeah, thank you, Joe, for the nice presentation. I also had one question myself. Um, so originally, how many buttons are for Atari? I mean, does it have- How many much? what? How many buttons is on the joystick of Atari? Oh, okay. <laughs> because Let's it see. happens that I went to a couple of these, um, you know, or arcade bars that, you know, they have these beautiful Atari machines. And one of it, <laughs> my, one of my job was, was to design that. So, okay, so here's the different controllers. Okay. So the, let's see, the controller port itself had, um, each controller port had nine pins. It had power, it had ground, it had four bi-directional ports that went into port A. So obviously if this is an eight bit port, it's four and four. And it had three more wires that went into this device here. Two of them were plain inputs, trigger inputs, and two of them on each port went into an RC um, array so that what would happen is under processor control, this thing at the top of the screen would discharge the capacitors and then release that discharge transistor. And these values would rise and the processor would pull the horizontal line, every line to look to see when one of those potentiometers toggled from a zero to a one. And so the video Olympics control, for example, could actually play a four player pong game 
or some other four player game where the inputs were not up, down, left, right, fire, but were, you know, up or down, left or right. Video Olympics actually had a four player pong game where one player is on this wall, one player is on this wall, one player is on this wall, and one player is on this wall. And the ball bounces all over the place and they play in teams. So one team is defending these two goals and the other team is defending these two goals. And they're trying to get the ball past their opponents with four controllers. So that's, um, to go back, These this pair of controllers has, um, right, so, one pair of these things plugs into one controller port. So Video Olympics could actually use two pairs of these things to control it. Whereas the controller port here has basically up, down, left, right, fire button. We also had a gray code encoded controller because we did a cartridge where you wanted to be able to rotate 360 degrees. We use these for that game. They weren't very popular. We also built some games that had a very crude keyboard input. So if you could take this keyboard and maybe slide it into this keyboard so you'd have basically 24 keys. So I would use the bi-directional ports to scan horizontally and the other inputs to go vertically so I could you know, see which key they're pushing. These things worked, but this machine couldn't really display much in the way of useful characters. So they weren't very useful. That answer your question about controllers. Oh, yes. Thank you very much, Joe. Now this new machine here, this machine and this machine actually could take four controllers. You could write a four player tank game for this thing. Um, I've prototyped one for my book, but I haven't published it yet. And this one here could take four game controllers. Yeah, that's very fascinating. Thank you, Joe. Any more Thank questions? While you're on that screen, I was wondering, actually, um, you talked about trying to get these arcade games to run, um, obviously Donkey Kong from Nintendo, Pac-Man uh, Pac from Namco. Um, was that something that those publishers supported as well? We had to pay the money. Right. We had to pay license fees. Now, so that, that was available for consumers then as well? Well, yes. I mean, those companies are happy to take the money. So, you know, this was written by an Atari employee, so they didn't give them any extra money at all, which became another problem for another day. But... Um, these, you know, we had to pay money to the people who invented this game, you know, royalties. We had to do this here. We had to do this here, as a matter of fact. And we had to do that here. These were popular um, arcade games that weren't invented by Atari's arcade people. But we were capable of generating a port which would play the same game. So, yeah. Did I answer that question? Yeah, cool, thank you. All right, any more questions? So Estefan, um, do you have any question yourself? No, I don't have a question such, but uh, just a quick comment. It was interesting to hear Joe's description and how a lot of his decisions were formed by cost. Uh, oh yeah. Yeah, and that's something that happens in consumer electronics when you work in industrial electronics cost is a secondary issue. You want to get something right. working in the market fast because the volumes are low. So, so a few dollars here, there doesn't matter. But in consumer electronics, every cent counts. And I remember my days in Philip. Absolutely. We had um, years sitting there for a month trying to design out one cent. And, if, and it seems like something really stupid, but with well, the volumes involved, it makes a big difference. I have a comment I'd make that's not in the slides, but if you've got the time, I'll take it. So, we designed this system here and I had an epiphany before we shipped it. I tried to convince management. I said, you know, we should 
This was going to cost us about $65 in U.S. in 1977. There's been a lot of inflation since then. But if it costs us $65, that suggested at a three to one markup that the suggested retail would be about $200. Now, for perspective, at that time in history, in the US, you could buy a decent, inexpensive new car for $2,500. And you could buy a house, a used tracked house for $25,000. So we were planning on selling that was at that time in history, kind of expensive. So they were, of course, worrying about how can we cut some more money out of this? But I said, you know, we want to spend, I would like to spend 50 cents more and get a 40 pin rather than a 28 pin 6502. Same dice, more expensive package. I wanted to spend some more money on the cartridge instead of a 20 four pin cartridge connector, have a 30 pin cartridge connector. Why? So that would have cost 50 cents plus 50 cents would be a dollar extra in cost. And marketing and management wouldn't do it. And here's what I wanted to do. If I could bring out the upper address lines, the clock, the read write line and the interrupt line, that would fill up this here, and that means I could take this game player and I could bolt onto it something that would be a computer. I could bolt on more memory and I could bolt on more IO devices. So I'd have something that would play the existing games and be expandable to a computer. Now, when we brought this thing out, we thought we might sell three or four cartridges per consumer. And there was a lot of profit in those cartridges, but we weren't expecting very many. So we needed to make our money on the game console itself. We didn't know that people would buy six or eight or 10 cartridges each. They'd, some people built huge collections of cartridges. So in retrospect, we could have sold this at a lower markup expecting to make our money off of the cartridges but we weren't we weren't that far sighted for one and for two when the custom when you know, we when we shipped it we didn't know it was going to ship for 10 years when people invest that much money in compatibility with your stuff if you walk away from them you're hurting yourself badly it's a self in terrible self-inflicted wound. But we didn't know this at the time. I've had this argument with Bushnell and Keenan and all those guys. If we had done this, we could have designed a machine with a roadmap so that the first machine is a simple game player, but you could plug in computer expansion instead. And so you could evolve to a computer rather than what we actually did which was a fresh start. Do you follow what I'm talking about? This is a lesson that might in fact, some of you somewhere in your future, somewhere in your future, you may be facing this, mm, do I wanna spend this much money now to future proof this design or is that too much money to spend? You follow what I'm saying? Absolutely. So in retrospect, I wish I'd learned that lesson but I didn't, we didn't, so here we are. So Atari went out of business in 1984 and it's been, pieces of it have been reassembled periodically since then, but it has never been a factor that it once was. Okay, so any more questions I can answer because I'm now 20 minutes over. So thank you, Joe. I guess that there is no other questions here. Thank you very much for your interesting talk. I really enjoyed. <laughs> now I pub I sent you the PDF. Yep. So you have my permission to send the PDF to at least everybody who attended, or and or if you've got a distribution list, 
um, for members of the CT Society in Sydney or the, what's the name of your section? New South Wales section, but actually okay. these series of talks, we'll be putting them on the CTSOC website and sure. anybody can uh, log in. And I want to give you my answer. explicit verbal permission to distribute this to anybody in the CT Society. Do I need yeah. to put that in writing? Yeah, well, we'll do that afterwards. Okay. Well, there you are. Good. Okay. Cheers, everybody. I think I'm done then, so I'm going to stop sharing. Okay, thank you, uh, Joel. I think uh, uh, we'll send you an e-certificate and I think uh, Joel will uh, talk to you, uh, we'll, we'll close off. Uh, I just want to make one last comment. Uh, welcome and thank you to all the participants from Hong Kong and Japan. We've had quite a few people from that part of the world join in, so it's been a true Good. Region 10 event. Uh, Excellent. So thank you, everybody. Joel. Yeah, thank you very much, everyone. Hope you have a good day. Thank you. Bye-bye. Cheers, everybody. And that means I'm done.